Good evening and welcome. My name is John Mack. I'm Director of Public Programs at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And welcome to the sixth annual Dr. Scholl Lecture on U.S.-China relations. I've had the pleasure of working with this year's fellow, Professor Zhang Weiying, throughout the month. And I'm very much looking forward to his comments tonight. I'd like to take a moment to thank Pam Scholl and the Dr. Scholl Foundation for the support of this initiative. We're honored to have worked with the foundation for years now and look forward to continuing to do so in the future. Before we move on to the next part of the evening, please take a moment to silence your phones, but as always, we encourage you to use social media. We're also live streaming tonight's event, so if your friends aren't here, please feel free to text them on your now silenced phones and uh, get them to tune in. Tomorrow afternoon, we'll post an online write-up of the lecture um, as written by our distinguished fellow, Richard Longworth. That'll be available online with the video of the event as well. As many of you know, the Chicago Council is a membership organization. Thank you to the members who are with us tonight. We very much appreciate your support. If you aren't a member, now is a good time to join and take advantage of the many benefits that come with membership. Details are online and printed materials are available on the way out. A few words on format for tonight. After Professor John Wayne gives his remarks, Phil Levy, our senior fellow on the global economy, will join him on stage for the Q&A session. And following this, Professor Zhang will sign copies of his book, uh, as sold by the bookstall in the back corner. Finally, to introduce our speaker tonight, please welcome to the stage the president of the Dr. Scholl Foundation and board director of the Chicago Council, Pam Scholl. Thank, thank you, John. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm delighted and honored to be here writing for academic journals. Zhang has authored, co-authored, and edited 18 books. As mentioned before by John, his most recent book, The Logic of the Market, Insider's View of Chinese Economic Reform, was released January 16th. So please, they're in the back, and um, I'm sure it's going to be a bestseller professor because that was my late mother's birthday. So um, he holds an undergraduate and master's degree from Northwest University and his master's in philosophy from the University of Oxford. Please join me in welcoming Professor Zhang Weiying. Thank you, Pan. It's a great uh, honor for me. It's the second uh, show visiting fellows to give you a talk on Chinese economy. I would like to thank Chicago Council and Shaw Foundation to give me this opportunity. I also would like to thank everyone here for your interest in China, my home country. Today, I'm going to talk something about China's future. Certainly, I need to start with the past. In past three decades, China has reached remarkable economic success. Average GDP growth rate is about, you know. So that is, uh, I think, major reason and China's economic growth will slow down. Second is the uh, diminishing of uh, cheap labor supply. China had a great reserve of labor force. Uh, but no, it's changed. Reason is uh, because of our family planning program, one child policy, which made is, uh, China's labor force actually uh, began to decline uh, after 2012. So past decades, actually labor cost has uh, increased annually by 15%. Uh, percent. That means every five years, labor costs doubled. That makes you know, many foreign investor companies feel that the Chinese labor, is even higher, uh, labor costs even higher than other countries. So some foreign investor companies began to move from China to other developing countries. Third uh, reason is uh, limited potential for global market. Particularly after the financial crisis, many countries, including American, uh, adopt the policy of uh, protectionism. I think that's bad, but uh, you know, that is a policy. China must face uh, this problem. And also, I think at the beginning of reform and development, China didn't pay much attention to environmental problem. Today, envir environmental problem become biggest issues. So we need to pay cost for what we have uh, done in the past. 
So environment cost will also increase the firm's production cost. That make Chinese firms less profitable, uh, 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 less competitive. So China needs to transfer from its traditional the old growth model we call the low cost uh, export driven uh, to more innovation based and uh, uh, more developed uh, 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 internal market uh, based uh, growth. And uh, that is a big challenge. And uh, how China can use this, uh, 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 can, how China can make this transfer depends on uh, many factors. Let me give you a simple model to understand this. Uh, actually, we learned from an economic textbook, the neoclassical growth model, which said mainly forecasts on investment, capital accumulation. Forget that. Also, forget something called the Keynesian model, which only forecasts on aggregate demand. We need to forecast something quite different. Actually, Smith's model was developed more than 200 years ago, you know. It's very simple. You, if you want to develop an economy, uh, create wealth, first important is productivity increase and innovation, which depends on division of labor and specialization, which in turn depends on extent of market. Put it in another direction, that is, uh, if we, ha we have a big market, then we have a deeper division of labor, uh, deeper specialization, then, uh, which will promote uh, productivity activity increase and uh, innovation, then we will have more wealth, more income. Then this more wealth, more income will become a uh, new market. So we have a very positive cycle for economic growth. Uh, this model can well explain the history of uh, past 200 years, the West. The West country actually uh, are developed partially because globalization of market. And also can well explain China's development of the past three decades. It's China's openness to global market made an important contribution to China's uh, economic development. Roughly speaking, Chinese company has well explored global market, but underdeveloped our domestic market. That is something I like to emphasize here. Uh, in past three decades, uh, before financial crisis, average uh, 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 growth rate of export is uh, 1.5 times of uh, GDP growth rate. As a result, by 2007, China's export GDP ratio reached uh, 37%, which is uh, actually highest uh, among, uh, second highest among uh, big economy, just uh, below uh, German economy. Uh, last few years, export growth slower than GDP growth. So we find is uh, 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 export GDP ratio drop down to 25%. Uh, that is uh, uh, also, I think, future trend. That means in future, it will be impossible Chinese export growth will faster than uh, GDP growth. Now it's probably the whole big China's home market. You know, it's the GDP size of China is uh, already uh, two thirds of America. That's quite big. Here, I like to break down the whole economy into provinces economy to say how big China's market, home market it is. In, uh, we, if we take each province of China as an independent economy, compared to other economy, economy, we will get some new information. For example, in 2000, uh, 2000 year, Guangdong's GDP was just 37% uh, of Taiwan. But uh, 2011, Taiwan's GDP was just 58% uh, of Guangdong. If we take, uh, uh, put uh, Taiwan into Great China, we just rank the number five economy. If we compare Guangdong with uh, Hong Kong, in 2000 year, Guangdong GDP was 70% of Hong Kong. But 2011, Hong Kong GDP was just 
less than one third, uh, uh, less than thirty percent of uh, uh, Guangdong. Uh, now actually, Hong Kong is only ranked number thirteen in Chinese regional economy. If we compare Chinese provinces with other uh, countries, we can also get a, a, a very interesting picture. Like uh, Guangdong, so as I said, number one economy in China, which is ranked is if in, is an independent country, ranked is number 18, just after the Turkey. It, which is uh, uh, Guangdong economy is bigger than Poland, bigger than Indonesia, uh, Belgium, Switzerland, Sweden, Southern Arabia. Shandong number, uh, number two, Jiangsu number three, both bigger than Norway, Austria, Iraq, Greece, Denmark, Argentina. Uh, Zhejiang number four, uh, which is still bigger than Venezuela, uh, Island, South Africa, which is number one economy in, uh, in Africa, uh, bigger than uh, like Henan number five, bigger than Finland, Thailand, uh, Portugal. I will not continue this list. But let me tell you that the smallest uh, economy in China is Tibet, but which is still bigger than Mongolia. So my story just told you that China is itself can be treated as half global. If China can well explore its domestic market, uh, potential of economic growth will be quite big. Uh, certainly, population is very important. Uh, you know that, and uh, 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 many provinces of China is uh, actually population size bigger than many developed, uh, big developed econom economies. Uh, like m many provinces have uh, uh, population uh, like uh, uh, 60, 70 uh, millions. And also Tibet is the smallest, but still bigger than Mongolia. Oh, uh, I also like to emphasize uh, uh, something else later, I will say. Uh, here I just summarize everything is a big market in China. Take a uh, food massage. You know, you know, Obama, President Obama tried to increase job opportunity. But in China, there's a food massage hire millions of people. Yeah, this is a uh, very big industry. Also, let's take uh, education. There are already 12 uh, Chinese companies listed in New York Stock Exchange. And also, like a uh, wedding market, Shanghai alone, every year there are about uh, 140 couples to marry. If you do this business, uh, you can still be very uh, profitable. Uh, so certainly also other markets uh, are the same. Uh, more than 200 years ago, Andrew Smith once said, the extent of China's home market is not much inferior to the market of all different countries of Europe put together. But China didn't make use of this opportunity. This was our system, our institution. Uh, even after 1949, China implemented uh, a system called the planned economy that was really banned. Now, we introduce the market, so it's uh, possible we make use of this uh, big domestic uh, uh, home market. I also like to add something else. That is uh, a, a figure of China's urbanization. Every year, there are more than one percentage of population moving from rural to urban area. That means uh, nearly 15 million people move from rural to urban. If one, each city uh, uh, one million, China needs to build 15 one million cities every year. So imagine how big demand it is. And uh, this is a uh, 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 highway development in China. Before 1988, there was no highway in China. First highway built in 1988 was just 100 kilometers. But after that, this uh, highway developed very fast. Now China has 100,000 kilometers highway. Uh, average transportation time between two points, now just uh, one third of 20 years ago. And China also developed the high-speed railway, which is really great. Uh, because all this development of uh, uh, transportation actually integrate the whole market into one market. So today, we can see, uh, yeah, we have really one market, the China market. Much uh, 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 come from development of uh, transportation. 
I would like to uh, say a few words about some co uh, people called domestic demand. You know, every day you read the newspaper and you think domestic demand. That is uh, not the correct concept. What I talked is a home market. It's different from that. Home market is a micro concept. Domestic demand is a macro concept, which means you can use monetary policy, you can use physical policy to stimulate demand, invest uh, consumption and export. My concept of home market uh, micro because it uh, depends how entrepreneurs to dis uh, discover, de uh, develop this market. Do not depend on any monetary policy, any physical policy. Uh, take uh, an analogy. Uh, if you talk about the domestic demand, you say, oh, do uh, aggregate, uh, aggregate demand is small. We encourage people like buy more computer. You already have one computer. Then I encourage you to buy a second computer by physical uh, uh, subsidies. Oh, when I talk about home market, I say, no, you need to create something new, something like iPad. That is create a new market. Uh, that is the difference between home market and domestic market concept. We need to give up Keynes economics, because which only forecasts current uh, aggregate demand. Why we invest? We, we invest for this year's uh, growth. No, we invest for future, future's productivity, future's value. According to Keynes uh, economics, why we eat, why we have clothes, that's for growth rate. So we encourage consumption for GDP. That's wrong. We, we produce GDP for consumption. Yeah, so that is the reason I think is uh, if we use Keynes model to, uh, to direct our economy, economic policy, we will make a lot of mistakes. We will waste a lot of resources, a lot of inefficient investment there. Then we will have new problem, like today China faced. Actually, after financial crisis, China adopted very big uh, stimulus policy. Uh, that is the reason why China today has so much uh, overcapacity problem. Now let me come back to this model. I just put a new player, which is the most important is entrepreneur. So I call the Smith Shen Peters growth model. Smith didn't mention much entrepreneurs, but uh, Shen Peter put his most important uh, is the uh, economic development force. Entrepreneurship is central. Everything in this cycle depends on entrepreneurs. Where is, what is market? Market is not there. Market need people to discover, develop, to create. So entrepreneurs' first job is to create a market. And also division of labor come from, you know, uh, uh, come from entrepreneurs like Bill Gates. He created a new industry which is called software industry. If you look at history, every new product, every new sector actually created by entrepreneurs. Also, you know, innovation is not a function of uh, uh, engineer, not a function of uh, technicians, but a function of uh, you know, uh, uh, entrepreneurs. Now, so when we become rich, how to transfer this new wealth, new income to new market? That is also a function of entrepreneurs. China, today we face overcapacity problem. Why? Because Chinese company so, uh, or Chinese entrepreneurs have not yet really transferred this new wealth into new market. So these entrepreneurs play central role in this economic uh, 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 circle. Uh, entrepreneurs actually have two basic functions. One I call it upcharge. Second is uh, innovation. Uh, by upcharge, I mean you just discover some disequilibrium. You buy at low price, sell at high price. You import some new products uh, from America, then produce in China. You can make money. Second is innovation, which is really create something new, which is not existing currently. Chinese entrepreneurs in past three decades, mainly did was uh, they, they did was just upcharge. Now they need to do more for innovation. One reason is, uh, as I argued earlier, is the room for upcharge is diminishing because of diminishing of uh, late comes advantage, because of diminishing of uh, low labor supply. But uh, China faces 
big challenge for this change, this transfer from arbitrary to innovation. There are many hurdles uh, to this transition. I just like to point a few of them. First, the state sector is too big. It is still cut for 35 percent, even more of, uh, of GDP. No country can be really innovation, innovative economy if there has the so big state sector. So this sector is not just uh, less efficient, but actually occupy a lot of resources, crowd out private sector. With the big state sector, even pri private sector have no real incentive to be innovative because they face unfair competition from those big monopolist state firms. Second is the Chinese economy still is over-regulated, particularly in financial sector. It's not easy to set up, actually almost impossible to set up uh, private financial institutes. And private uh, 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 cost of financial, uh, financial, uh, financial cost of uh, private sector actually double that of uh, state sector. As the state sector pay 5% interest rate, private need to pay 10, that's average. Uh, fortunately, they, you know, a lot of foreign companies come to China. Uh, we see PE, which really gave great help for Chinese uh, uh, entrepreneurs, particularly uh, new high-tech industry. Uh, many uh, 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 major owner of high-tech uh, firms in China is owned by foreigners, not by Chinese. Uh, third one is uh, weak protection in property rights. Here, I do not mean just mean like intellectual property rights. Even physical, tangible property rights also big problem and not well protected. That is why many Chinese people, Chinese entrepreneurs, are not feel secured when they become rich. They like to make immigration. When they try to make Im uh, immigration, really they have no intention to do innovation. And China is not yet a rule of law society. Although China is on that way, there's a, a government that creates a lot of rules, policies, also very changeable. But that makes entrepreneurs find it very difficult to decide what they should do. Very difficult to look long term. So they have more interest to do short term uh, profitable activity, not long term innovation. You know, when you want to do innovation, this is really a long time. You do this, decide today to do R and D. Maybe you will harvest in ten, even twenty years. If there is no stable future, nobody would like to make investment today. And also, government has policy, which we call the industry policy. Government say which is important, which is not important, which we should support, which we should not support, by financial and the monetary. Uh, Marriage. I know some American scholars, politicians, very much admire Chinese industry policy. They argue that if we American uh, had such policy, our economy problem would be solved. I t let me tell you that that is not correct. No single industry policy has been successful in China. Reason is simple. This industry policy assumes that government officials are more entrepreneurial than entrepreneurs. They see future clear. They know what is the most important product, new technology. They know what is the new market. You know, this is totally wrong. You know, entrepreneurs do that job. Or many of them still fail. Those people stay in government, no any risk, no any incentive. How could they see future better than entrepreneurs, than business people? So by nature, this industry policy will fail. Any country take this policy will fail. And also, you know, corruption is a big issue. Because it's so serious corruption, entrepreneurs, business people, really need to do a lot of activity, which is not the uh, wealth creation, but rent seeking. And also, there is an institutional problem which divides China into a rural market and urban market. So China needs a further reform. I just mentioned these two major aspects. First is economic reform. 
We still, we have done quite a lot. Liberalized price control, privatized some state sector, developed some private sector. But we need to do more. Particularly, I like to mention three aspects. First is a further reduce state sector. I hope government will reduce state sector to below 10%, not like today is 35 or 40 percent. Uh, second is uh, deregulate control, particularly financial sector, not just the interest rate control. Also, let people have more freedom to set up uh, financial institutions. Uh, third one is privatized land. There are a lot of land used by peasants, farmers, but they cannot uh, exchange this. So land is assets, not capital like here. If we change the land from assets to capital, and uh, China, Chinese financial market will be much, much better developed. So these three uh, aspects of economic reform, uh, I think you have I should be optimistic because our Prime Minister Li Keqiang has done quite a lot of things uh, with this respect. And he just tried uh, very hard to deregulate the economy, to encourage more and more people to do business. He calls a mass uh, startup, mass innovation. Second is more difficult, but I think it become more and more important that the legal and the political reform. This includes two aspects. First is uh, I call constitutionalization. That is how to build the rule of law society. This is including set up independent traditions, uh, including the have a real legal system and culture to protect the human beings' rights and property rights. And also include certainly put the government and the law, not above law. Currently, we must say that in many cases, government is still above law. If government above law, people will really confused. They don't know what they should do. And they have no confidence. The second is democratization. That will certainly be a long time project, not for the moment, but it's very important. So the whole this reform, I think, needs probably uh, another 30, even 40 years to complete. So we must be very, very patient. We cannot change this system overnight. During this process, I think very, very important is uh, how to combine democracy with uh, uh, meritocracy. I think American system is more like a best combination of uh, democracy and uh, meritocracy. Certainly you know more than I know. For this change, particularly I think we need, or re this reform call for ideas and leadership. I give you this framework, because time is limited. I just give you a talk few words. Idea could be right or wrong. Leadership could be strong or weak. The best combination is the right idea and the strong leadership. Worst combination is the fourth quadrant. That's the wrong idea strong leadership. <laughs> like uh, Mao Zedong, Chairman Mao, uh, he was a very strong leader. But he had the wrong idea. He believed the planned economy, believed believe the public ownership, believed the centralization. Deng Xiaoping was located in first quadrant. His idea different from Mao. He believed the market, believed entrepreneurship, believed the grassroots initiative, believe the decentralization. That is led China's economic growth so fast. Now today, there are a lot of wrong ideas. China must uh, get rid of them. One idea I just like to uh, mention, that is the uh, China model. Some people argue that why China has been so successful, because China takes very unique approach to development. Uh, that is not right. Why China, my argument is why China has been successful in past three decades. That's because government control lies and lies. State sector becomes smaller and smaller. But why China still have so many problems? Really is also simple, because government is still too powerful. State sector still too dominant. So if we continue this reform, let's put government and law 
reduce government power. We establish limited government. And we reduce state sector to minimum, like less than 10%. And the Chinese economy will have good future for growth. And also, we can solve other problems, like a corruption problem. Why corruption is so serious? That's because the government is too powerful. Uh, whenever you have big government, unlimited government, you, have, you will have a pervasive corruption. Now, come to my conclusion. China is still has good potential for high growth, particularly uh, 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 because we have a very big uh, home market. Key transition to new growth model is that entrepreneurs will transfer from arbitrary imitation-based activity to innovation-based activity. It really reduces cost and create more value for consumers. This much depends on further reform, particularly not just economic, also political and legal reform. So I cannot give you a very determined conclusion. I just like to tell you what I am thinking now. I think China still have great hope, but we also have a big uh, uncertainty. If you think my presentation is not good, please read my book. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Professor Zhang. That was excellent. It covered an awful lot of topics. Um, I'm going to take advantage of my position and perhaps ask you a few follow-up questions, and then we'll open things up to all of you so you can uh, start planning ahead, thinking. I wanted to invite you. There was a natural next question. You showed us the, the quadrants, mm -hmm. and you characterized some of China's history. We have a relatively new administration in China now with Xi Jinping. Where does... Where does this new administration fit um, on the right ideas, wrong ideas, strong versus weak? <laughs> uh, that is a very challenging question. <laughs> uh, I, I, I try to answer. Yeah. I think is, uh, Xi Jinping is a very strong leader, uh, compared, particularly compared to his uh, predecessor. Yeah, very strong leader. Now, I think he's also missionary. Uh, yeah, that's my basic, uh, I think uh, I'm confident, yeah, really. That's my very confident judgment. Uh, but uh, I think we still need to say, um, really, I think he also has a lot of good ideas. Like he said, life of uh, constitution law is its the implementation. That's a very important. You know, China, we have constitutional law which is reasonable, I think, good. A lot of uh, uh, good uh, clauses in that, including like a freedom of speech, freedom of public, uh, uh, publication, and also protection of property rights, although that was just recent ended. Yeah, quite good. So his argument, I think, is uh, 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 right. But the problem is uh, China, and not really implemented this constitution. Uh, like in the court, you can cite any other laws to defend your case. But sorry, you cannot cite the constitution. Yeah, so I think it's a, his, uh, this argument is very, very important. So I still have uh, something optimistic about his ideas. But as I said, China still has some very bad ideas. You know, and idea is most important. Yeah, Deng Xiaoping, he made a great change, this is an idea. Mao Zedong made a great change, also a very bad change, but also because of his ideas. I think uh, our e economists, I'm an economist, we focus too much on interest. We say, that, you know, people are just always driven by interest, their self-interest. In some sense, he's right. It's really many people are driven by interest. But I this cannot explain why George Washington and his colleague built this American system. You, we cannot say this, oh, that's for his personal interest. It cannot explain why Deng Xiaoping launched this reform. We cannot say this, oh, Deng Xiaoping launched this reform for his uh, material interest. No, that's an idea. A great man must have great ideas. 
Right. So I hope Xi Jinping will be great leader, have great ideas. Thank you. You know, we argue about this in the American system, but I'm curious in the Chinese system, what is it that makes someone a strong leader? Is it the that they have strings that they can pull on everyone else and make them do what they want? What what makes someone a strong leader in China? I think strong leader is more like entre uh, entrepreneurs. You know, some you know, you born, you know, you cannot uh, study this from EIB or some program, right? That that is a, uh, uh, I think, a very personal characteristic. <laughs> Uh, but it's uh, certainly uh, everywhere, every country, economy, you always have some people can be great leader, great entrepreneurs. Uh, probably whether you have good institutional environment, and which those good people, most the intelligent, uh, intelligent, talented people, will become real leader. Uh, China faces this challenge. That is because the Chinese. Uh, system become, I call it a totally bureaucratization system. Uh, you, if you want to be a, a top leader, you must go all this uh, through this bureaucratic process. You know, politi great politicians are different from uh, bureaucrats, just like entrepreneurs are different from professional managers. Uh, if you just, uh, you know, if every CEO of company must go through this uh, professional manager, Process you couldn't have a new firm, couldn't have a new uh, 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 like Bill Gates and uh, uh, Stephen Jobs, yeah, such a person. So that is a problem. Uh, but uh, I think uh, also sometimes you, if you are lucky, you f you may have you know different choice. Uh, take China as an example. I think uh, Xi's, Xi Jinping's background, fam family background, is very very important. For he, for him, to maintain some leadership, uh, his encouragement, and uh, his uh, mission, uh, wish. Really, is a, uh, and the Chinese system. If you're from a very low income family, there are no any strong family background. You cannot afford to make any mistake during this career, your pr uh, 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 bureaucratic career, like uh, me. I'm from a rural area. If I, I were working in government, if I made any mistake, I will finish. It's right? a good thing you've had decades so of I being error-free. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, some people, you know, if they're from very strong uh, 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 families, you know, they can afford to make some mistake. That means not really they make mistake. That's because they can afford. So they will be brave enough to do something, you know, they can take risk. Uh, that is that's quite different. Yeah. Certainly, uh, this is uh, leadership is a very important topic. Uh, many people doing research. I have no full knowledge about that. I just observe that leader is different from bureaucrats. Entr like, like entrepreneurs are different from bureau uh, uh, professional managers. Yeah. We need to have a really institutional environment. Uh, those are really best politicians could uh, play a good role. So you've, you've uh, stressed the importance of entrepreneurship um, and both sort of what China's done and sort of the need for China going forward um, and some of the challenges that there are to being an entrepreneur. If you watch the business news in recent months, you've seen a very prominent example of Chinese entrepreneurial ability. Um, Jack Ma, for example, with Alibaba. What do we make of the rise of, of someone like him does that show that it, it is feasible and these hurdles aren't so high, or is he the exception that proves the rule? Uh, certainly, uh, l l let me tell you, in my book, I, could, uh, I identify three group of entrepreneurs, Chinese entrepreneurs. First group I call the uh, uh, peasant background entrepreneurs. Second is the official background entrepreneurs. The third is the ret overseas retired uh, engineer background entrepreneurs. That is actually three decades, is, uh, uh, one by one, come. First generation was very important. Just, uh, also the first generation of Chinese entrepreneurs, mainly from rural area. They had no choice go to government, no choice go to state sector. Then Deng Xiaoping gave freedom, so you can do business. Then they become entrepreneurs. So this is so simple. At that time, many people who could find a job in the government or state sector wouldn't like to do any business. 
private business. But after Deng Xiaoping's uh, visit, uh, source visit of 1992, you know, China had more freedom. And those government officials, particularly those some people, government officials, made this political mistake during 1989 political event. They find they have no future in government. Then they switch to business. A lot of, uh, uh, of financial sector and uh, real estate sector business people like those people. Third generation, that is about uh, during the internet uh, or high tech uh, 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 year, you know, like Jack Ma. Yeah. yeah. Also, that is a uh, you know historical uh, uh, change. Let me also give you like Jack Ma. Uh, many people like that. One reason you find is uh, those sectors, government didn't really control very much. There were some new entrepreneurs come. When the government understand and try to control, it would be difficult. So that's the internet industry, really government didn't understand. So a lot of uh, new entrepreneurs, new good companies, not like uh, Jack Ma's, Alibaba, also we have like Baidu, Tencent, they, they come. So I mean, it's, uh, anywhere, if you have freedom, you will have entrepreneurs. So for my last question, before I turn it over to the audience, I wanted to sort of bring the United States into this a bit, where you, you've talked about this progress. A lot of this did occur through international commerce. You talked about a need now to turn towards the home market. Um, we see Chinese companies listing in the United States. How would you characterize the state of U.S.-China relations right now? Do the two countries understand each other? Is this a healthy relationship? Yeah, I think there are the two kind of uh, conflict between China and the United States. One is the uh, interest conflict, second like value conflict. Yeah, that dominate uh, you know our two countries' relation. Uh, to my understanding, conflict of interest is really very minimal. Much of uh, conflict between China and the U.S. come from our misunderstanding, miscommunication. Uh, actually, we have we, we can play one one game, uh, and also I, I know some American people worried oh your China become big and uh, challenge American. Uh, in some sense, uh, yes, yeah, like market, you know, Chinese company come and compete with American company, but it, American company also come to China to, to make quick good profits, you know. So that is uh, also collaboration most important. So I think most from misunderstanding or some later. Uh, ship style, and uh, uh, let me see. Uh, I think I do not think really China or include Chinese leader, top leader, would like to challenge American global leadership. No, I, I think that's not good for China. It's a it's a leadership really costly, very very costly. You can do that, we can't. You know, we are not so rich to do that, right? No. So I think a Chinese leader also understand that, right? The problem I think is for some Chinese people, sometimes including I myself, I think it's, uh, oh, you need to change leadership style. You need to change leadership style. Yeah. Really like the, the world people, including Chinese people, you know, accept this leadership from heart. So that is uh, very important. So I once uh, uh, recommended, uh, 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 let me say that, I recommend uh, to American politicians to read two books. Uh, first book, as I mentioned, Anna Smith's book, Wealth of a Nation, was published in 1976. Uh, uh, 70, 76, yes. That was the independent year of your country. Mm. Argument, basic argument was free trade is good for everyone, every nation. But I really thought that you know, today in America, a very strong attitude to implement this uh, protectionist policy. That's not good. Not, not just good for China, also not good for America. But the free trade, I think, very, very free flow resources, including human resources. You know, as I, I, I recently found this good. Is, uh, I got a 10 year visa. You know, so I will be uh, easier to come to America in the next 10 years, you know. So that is, uh, I think this is a good policy, you know. <laughs> so you, you need like all resources, uh, physical, human, you know, move more freely, that's good. 
Second book I recommend that was a Lao Tzu's book, Taoism, Dao Te Jin. Basic argument of that book is uh, play little role with a very low profile. Uh, very low profile. That is very, uh, very important. I, I mean, so sometimes I feel American politicians play too high profile, you know. You know. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, that, that's my argument. We'll be looking for Taoism in the primaries uh, coming up. <laughs> so, but it's, it's, it's sound advice. I'm not sure we're going to see it. Um, all right, with that, let me invite questions from the audience. Um, and I'll call on you. Please identify yourself and then ask your question. Uh, let's start right back here, please. No, right here. Yes. Me? Yes. Okay, I thought you said sir. Sorry. Um, thank you very much for your speech. I really enjoyed it. Um, my question is, um, would you say that uh, more innovation, entrepreneurial mindset depends on educational reform in China? And if so, how would you go about doing that? Oh, thank you. That's a very important question. Uh, you know, it's uh, really a uh, Chinese uh, education system have a lot of problem. One problem is really teach people knowledge, skill knowledge, not encourage they do some creative since, yeah, we always see that every question has a single correct answer, no other answer. So that is, I think, Chinese education system problem. We need to change that. And uh, uh, certainly today, many uh, Chinese students come to American higher education, not just the postgraduate, the undergraduate. Today, a lot of uh, uh, high school grad uh, students come. Uh, I think that is a quite good openness, is quite good. I hope Chinese government will change this system. But currently, it, uh, it, it seems uh, difficult. Uh, government invests a lot of money. Today, actually, di very different from 10 years ago. 10 years ago, Chinese university was rarely short of money. Today, there are really a lot of money there. But that is a misunderstanding. Uh, uh, that uh, as long as we have enough investment, enough money put into university, we will have good university. That's wrong. University is same. We need a market. We need competition. Why American have the best uh, university system? That's because of anyone can set up university. Right here. Now this university, you know, they, they compete. You need to have good reputation. You, know, you need to have good faculty. You need to have, uh, have to do good research. And you have a lot of uh, good university. If, if we see in Europe, it's quite different. All their universities are controlled by government. So in the past, they had good university. Today, there are very few good university coming from continental Europe. The China, same. My argument is uh, education must be liberalized. Must let the people have freedom to provide various educations, not just the university level, but also primary, middle school, high school level uh, education. Competition between state and private universities, schools. Competition among, uh, between different uh, private universities. That will really change universities. Otherwise, it will be really very difficult. All right. Um, Right here in the end, in the second row, please. Uh, how big of a role do you think social media might play in uh, bringing out the, uh, about these reforms? Uh, certainly, it's very, very important because all ideas need to spread. You know, uh, social media is a very important uh, 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 channels to spread these ideas. And China is, uh, you know, we a traditional uh, uh, media. Now we have a new media, you know. There's the internet media. They played a very, very important role. And uh, so it's a very difficult to have real control over this uh, information uh, spreading. Yeah. I think I hope we'll be playing more and more positive role. Uh, May I ask a follow-up question on that? One of the interesting things, because it's hard to control and because we get people who follow the, the social media in China, Sometimes this is taken as representative of Chinese opinion. How much should we look at that as 
representing what the Chinese people think, or is this a particular segment of, of Chinese opinion? Oh, that is uh, not easy. You know, if you read the media, you find is many popular argument. Uh, that is actually just a small group of people. Yeah, but I think it's, uh, that is normal. I, if we have really have freedom of uh, 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 press, right? you know, everyone can express his idea. Then the observer just uh, you know they need to make analysis. You know, but the past we have only one voice. You know, today we have I think uh, various voices. That is very very good. And also, then I think new media has played more. I think, uh, although there is a lot of uh, a problem, but I think many people now get the true information just from this new media, and not from traditional uh, media. Thank you. Um, let's go to the back here. Yes. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Michael Ovescu, and I'm a high school student with San Ignatius. Uh, Today, China has um, many issues that they're actually being forced to deal with, uh, environmental issues. The university students are pressuring for democratic reforms, uh, wage gaps. Um, and how is President Xi, uh, Xi Jinping going to be able to balance all of this? Is it possible for him to advance the economy and answer all of these questions that are being asked of him? That is a leadership problem, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Why we need lead? We need leaders. Just because there are so many problems you need to balance, you know. Yeah. I think yeah, uh, uh, for some issues like environmental uh, issues, as I mentioned, really big pressure. You know, I know American government, American people argue for Chinese government to do this, to do that. That's right. But actually, no need for even, no your demand. Chinese people become more demanding. Uh, uh, when you know, people are poor, environment, what kind of error uh, you, you don't mind. But then when you become rich, you care more about that. So today, like Beijing, pollution is serious. Some people like to move to other places, even not America, not Canada, but move, move to South China, you know. And make these uh, Chinese companies difficult to maintain its uh, employees, good employees. You know, my school, uh, actually my previous uh, uh, school is the Guanghua School Management. We had a very good professor who graduated from America. He was promoted just a few years from assistant professor to full professor. And recently, he resigned. No other reason. Only one reason is that he took his children to Canada, stayed some time. When he came back, his children no longer like to stay in China, uh, uh, Beijing. So they moved to Singapore. They got a job in, uh, at the uh, Singapore Nat uh, National University of Singapore. Yeah, I mean, so Chinese people also <laughs> become very, very demanding. That, that, that is a big pressure for a uh, top leader to solve this uh, problem. So there are other kind of problem. Uh, actually, all problem you need to find uh, uh, a right solution. You know, we cannot become some man called it environmentalism. You know, that is not not right. What is the best way for us to solve environment? I think it's still new technology, which come from innovation, and also I think market. Market is a good way, good measure to solve. Uh, environment problem. Also like a income gap. We, you, you know, in, ma in market, we have income gap. High wage, low wage. That's determined by your productivity. You know, because of competition. If uh, I'm an employer, I hire you, uh, give you like uh, 100,000. If you pro produce more than that, some people will come, bid, okay? You will go there. So the competition will dis Determine what is a fair price, fair wage. Yeah. So it's a different people have different wage. That's natural. That's the market. Yeah. Probably is in China. Some people get more, not because they are entrepreneurial, not because they are more productive, but just because they, they could get some resources, which uh, controlled by government. Yeah. So people are not happy with that. 
no, no, very few people complain about like Jack Ma's wealth. Uh, Li Ye Hong of uh, uh, Baidu's uh, uh, founder, uh, he's rich. But we really can play some people who didn't really create value for consumers, for other people, but they become rich through rent seeking. Yeah. So in my book, why I call it a lot of market, I know it's your no market uh, much better than me, but I try to summarize some basic uh, fundamental principle. What is the market? Market means if you want to be happy, you must make other people happy first. That is the market. You are employer, you must make an employee, investor, all happy. No. But in China, we have still have a you know, big uh, room for, I call it, logic of robbery. That you want to be happy, you make you happy, self happy by sacrificing other people's happiness. That, that is why we need to change. So that is very important for top leader to understand this. Uh, my will is that during the past decade, I mean it's from 2003 to 2012, that 10 years, that decade I call the lost decade because government misidentified reasons of income gap, other problem. They thought that, oh, why is, you know, people complain? Why we have a so big income gap? That's because we introduced the market. So we no read, we no need to con control market, demarketization. <laughs> that is totally wrong. That is, as a result, we can observe that. In 2003, uh, government proposed that we need, to uh, we need to build up we call it harmless society. Result is uh, 10 years later, we find this society ma much less harmless than at the beginning. So if you take a wrong approach, you will make it worse rather than solve the problem. So that I think idea is uh, so important. You must have a right idea to solve those serious big problems. Thank you. I wanted to follow up on this, uh, come back to the environment for a second. You, in your presentation, made a very interesting point, which is reminding us of the size of some of China's provinces, mm -hmm. that they're often bigger than yeah. important European countries. You talk about the incentives for top leaders, but of course a lot of policy is made at the provincial level, where it's actually implemented. Are there incentives for provincial leaders to address things like environmental issues, or do they just get rewarded for meeting GDP targets? I think there are some difference. Certainly, they also face uh, pressure, like Beijing's uh, mayor, you know. He faces a very high pressure to solve this uh, air pollution problem. But roughly speaking, I think uh, local leaders, government leaders, more like to emphasize on GDP growth. Uh, they, because there are some like uh, competition, compete for growth rate. And then recently, you know, central government uh, proposed in future we would not emphasize this GDP growth rate. Once you have integral, any like your company, once you have some so we, so called uh, performance index, uh, that will direct people's behavior. You know, when government emphasizes the growth rate, the local, all the, these local officials try to perform better. That, that, is, a, uh, that is the incentive system. Uh, uh, currently, yeah, certainly local government, they try, uh, they put the uh, uh, development uh, before any environment problem. But uh, increasingly, they also face a uh, uh, big challenge from ordinary people. Uh, so that my view is really in some very poor areas, Certainly, I think have food, have clothes, have house is more <laughs> important than have uh, clear air. Yeah. But we, we, we need to greatly solve that problem. Thank you. All right, uh, next question, please. Over here. Thank you very much. 
Um, you mentioned the rule of law as being a, an area that the China needs to implement and, and protect its constitution. So many officials and uh, so many Communist Party members are invested in, in actually being above the law. So is it possible um, for the, the Communist Party and for the, the government to reform itself, um, or does it ha reform have to come from, from outside the system? Well, I think it's certainly possible. Yeah. We must uh, hold hope on that. Otherwise, we'll, you know, how China could change. Yeah. Uh, certainly, it's a very big challenge, uh, very difficult in China. In the many government officials, they used to above law. Uh, uh, and Chairman Mao's leadership, there was a known law. And he was the only law people to follow. But today, we changed a lot. We have a really, China really passed a lot of laws. But there is a misunderstanding that uh, Rule of law means we have law, then we follow law. That's wrong. Rule of law really means we need, first we need to have a right law. You know, right law. Right law means really promote pe human beings' cooperation. Uh, respect the people's rights. You know, that's most important. So China, uh, I think first we need to really uh, uh, correct our laws. You know, Many laws, policies, regulations, not right. Uh, from efficiency point of view, also from equity point of view, not right. We need to change that. And second is, uh, you know, gradually, uh, 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 we, we need to realize everyone, particularly government, follow that rules. Yeah. Today, I think, uh, 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 certainly, uh, there's a big pressure. You know, government, uh, you know, ordinary people, you can go to court to sue government officials, although maybe not easy to be successful. But I think you have this opportunity. Some people would like to try. You know, law of rural society, we just build through this process. You, you make a case, you go to court, then gradually you know, the situation will be improved. You, know, you cannot have a system like a totally top down. Uh, Thank you. Um, right here on the edge. Uh, Professor Wan Chun Hao. Uh, my name is Dennis Thorne. Uh, I'm an attorney here in Chicago. I spend a good deal of time in China looking at residential real estate pro projects. And my question relates to the residential real estate condition in China. Uh, all the projects I've looked at, um, a lot of them seem to be showing the same disturbing trends that we saw prior to 2000. So my question to you is, do you think that the residential real estate market there in China is problematic. Um, depending on who you speak to there, of course, you get conflicting stories about whether or not they can run ahead of this problem or whether or not they are following the uh, same disturbing trends that the United States followed. Yeah, I think there are some big problem uh, in this market. Uh, people will was so optimistic, you know. Everyone tried to buy more and more because experience told them you can never lose when you buy a house. You know, that is the wrong lesson. Partly, I think, attributed to some macro policy. Let me tell you that is uh, 2008 in Beijing, actually also other provinces in China. Um, uh, house price going down, really going down. Then government worried that. And nine, uh, 2009, uh, the government uh, implemented some policy to encourage the people to buy more housing, buy more housing. Uh, then that is put the you know, house price up. Just half a year later, government from, hey, this is big trouble. Then try to everything to crack down this uh, market, uh, crack down this price. But it didn't work. Because the money, there's too much money printed there. Yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, I mean, there's a, a big problem, and uh, uh, that is the one reason I do not agree that the government should print in too much money to stimulate economy. When you, s you, you may try to s uh, stimulate here, but actually money will go to there. You know, that is the market principle. 
Um, a last question. Um, who, the, right here, please. You mentioned that you thought that uh, change in China will have to come from the inside in the future. The uh, incredible economic growth that China's had over the last 30 years seems to have stemmed from exactly that kind of thing. Uh, started by um, uh, Deng Xiaoping. Do you have any sense of what caused him to decide to adopt the market economy? Deng Xiaoping? Yes. I think his personal experience was very, very important. You know, for good politicians, you need to have uh, some difficulty period. You know, that make you think, uh, rethink. Re you, you may change your own ideas. I think Deng Xiaoping was uh, 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 put down by Mao uh, three times. The, the last time was, uh, 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 second time uh, uh, was the most important for him. He lived in very poor area, and he was not treated very well. <laughs> so that make him think, why we like this, you know? We tried very hard to build a great country, to improve people's life. But uh, after so many years, people have no enough food. Why? It makes them think. Yeah. So his idea was, uh, uh, when he took power, his idea was uh, very different you know, from Mao. He didn't believe in really planned economy. He didn't believe those uh, top uh, uh, officials in government can make uh, decisions what we should do, what we should produce. And also, I think, uh, uh, as I said, he, because he, he found so many people was uh, uh, starving, you know, had no e enough food. That, that is an urgent uh, problem. Actually, at the beginning of reform, no something called a blueprint. Chinese government had no clear idea what we should do. But they have urgent issue. Fortunately, that urgent issue, that is a problem we must solve, no matter we do next stage. And also Deng Xiaoping, I said, Deng Xiaoping is a good, very great leader. I mean, in terms of my uh, 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 definition, uh, strong leadership. Uh, let me give you an example, play your field uh, uh, interesting. Uh, he uh, took uh, office in 1977. Immediately, he was appointed in charge. Actually, he asked uh, for charging of education and research, uh, science, technology. For education, his idea was simple. We need modernization, industry modernization. For this, we need human resources, and good talents, now well-educated people. He said, oh, current education system is not good. Because uh, at that time, uni university recruited students from we call the workers, the parents, uh, and the soldiers. No exam. Whether you could be recruited does not depend on your knowledge, your mm, talents, but depends on your political correctness. Yeah, you that is totally wrong. We need to uh, recruit students through exam. Actually, that was old system before Cultural Revolution. But uh, he faced resistance from the administration. A minister of education uh, and also her colleague didn't like to do that. You know, they were still very more style, very uh, lefty. You know. He told Deng Xiaoping that this is a very compl complicated project. We need to do research. Let's take a long time. So we cannot do this this year. That is. Uh, Remember, 1977. They reported Deng Xiaoping. For some leaders, who, weak leaders, okay, he misses, okay, please do research, do uh, feasibility research, okay? We, we need to prepare, really need to take a, uh, a prepare for that. Deng Xiaoping did decide, did decide. okay, I understand. If you have a capability to do that, please do that. If you have no capability to that, I know who have a capability to that. Let's finish. Okay. Then, you know, that is the first year, 1977. Nation nationwide implemented this exam, uh, college entry exam. I was that year, took exam. 
I was very fortunate. I was, you know, went to university. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, you did, and, we, and thank you for strong and doing an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight. As we described, copies of Professor Zhang's book are available in the back, and he would perhaps be willing to sign some of those. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll show you. Don't worry. Um, but thank you very much for joining us.